Before this video starts, I assume you have come from the video produced by Cretaceous Cast, covering the month of April on some of the most notable paleontological discoveries of the year. And as you may or may not know if you've just clicked on this video, this is a part of a video series created by the Expeditioners Discovery Guild known as Paleo Rewind, which sets out to document some of the most notable, important, or interesting discoveries and or descriptions throughout a given year. This series will feature content creators who primarily produce videos on paleontology, and allows us all to collaborate in one big project, to both share our love for this subject and to keep you all up to date and informed, and also to expose our respective audiences to channels they may or may not have known of before. So, if this is your first time here, thank you for being here, and I would highly recommend subscribing as my channel covers a wide range of topics, most predominantly paleontology, but also zoology, anthropology, and anything science-related which I and many others find intriguing. I have made videos since 2018, interacting with a supportive community which has built the channel where it is today, and in the process, creating largely well-admired videos although some can come with some controversy given the subjects or age of the video. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this foray into some of the most notable discoveries in a month of the year, which has proven challenging to so many worldwide, and hopefully this series will be a satisfying conclusion so that we can begin anew in 2021. The first of these descriptions and discoveries to be covered for the month of May is one covering the rather well-known dinosaur genus of Edmontosaurus, with a paper reaffirming that the Arctic inhabiting genus of Ugranaluk was a nomen dubium of Edmontosaurus, although what they could be specifically still remains up in the air. This was based on anatomical comparisons and phylogenetic analysis, which demonstrated that these animals, based mostly on juvenile remains, did not fit the requirements for a genus-level distinction. Until more adults of these more northern animals are found though, the exact position these northern hadrosaurs fill is uncertain, as to whether or not they were a distinct species within the genus of Edmontosaurus, or just simply specimens of an already accepted genus like Regalis. Time will tell as to how these highly successful and generalised animals relate to others of their kind, and it will be interesting to see what position future studies take. Dromaeosaurs have always been known of to be active predators, but their methods of and behaviours while hunting are less certain and can be quite unclear. This study, conducted by the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, looks into the dinosaur genus Deinonychus to determine whether or not they were social animals that hunted in packs, with the results finding that they likely did not hunt in coordinated groups like dogs and other such animals do today. The problem with the idea is that archosaurs, like modern birds and crocodilians, do not usually hunt in groups and rarely target prey larger than themselves, although there have been cases showing otherwise on occasion. <coughs> Instead, the scientists proposed a different model that is thought to be more similar to Komodo dragons, in which individuals may have attacked the same animal on occasion, but their cooperation or group dynamic was limited. This was supported by evidence that there was a correlation between pack hunting and the diet of the animals as they grew, with pack hunting animals generally not showing a major shift in dietary diversity as they age. In Komodo dragons, hatchlings are at risk of being eaten by adults, and so take refuge in trees, but they find food sources unavailable to their ground-dwelling parents. Scientists utilise stable isotopes of carbon and oxygen to get an idea of the diets and water sources from them, also looking at a crocodilian and a herbivorous dinosaur from the same formation. The scientists found the Cretaceous crocodilians, just like modern species, showed a difference in diets between the smallest and largest teeth, indicating more solitary hunting, and what would be expected for animals where parents provide little food for their young. What was found was that Deinonychus possessed the same pattern, where the smallest and largest teeth had different carbon isotope values, indicating different diets, meaning that they would have been more solitary animals, likely only getting together for mating or when hunting the same prey opportunistically. This method could also be used more in the future to determine other animals' behaviour, so keep on the lookout for any more studies covering this. Sexual dimorphism is a great way to tell animals apart, also giving inferences to behaviour as well. It's from this that sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs has been a long-standing and interesting discussion, but gleaming it from fossils, which can be sparse and have preservation bias, means that recording it is very hard. Some attempts have been made to try and show it, but new research by the Queen Mary University of London has shown that despite previous claims of success, 
it's still very difficult to spot differences between the sexes. The study analysed the skulls from modern gharials to see how easy it was to distinguish between males and females, using only fossil records. They were used for the study as, like many dinosaurs, they were large, slow-growing and laid eggs, making a good model in turn. Males are larger in size and possess a fleshy growth on the end of their snouts, which is supported by a bony hollow near the nostrils which is identifiable in their skulls. The research team studied 106 gharial specimens across the world, and found that aside from the presence of the nereal fossa, it was very hard to distinguish males from females, even if they knew beforehand which was which. With many dinosaurs, the sample size is simply very low, and so the task is made much harder. And unless the differences are really striking or there is a clear feature like the fossa in gharials, the struggle to tell males and females apart will continue. In many species as well, sexual dimorphism can go beyond the skeleton, with integuments like iridescent feathers and other colour or display structures unfortunately rarely fossilising. An example of a claim of success being largely disproven came in the form of an argument that stated that female Tyrannosaurus were larger than males, although this was based on records from 25 broken specimens, and with the lack of data and probability this was just individual variation, the conclusion is not too well supported. Large, nectonic suspension feeders have evolved multiple times across complex life, having occurred four times among chondrichthyna fishes, baleen whales, mesozoic pachycormid fishes, and at least twice in anomalous caridids during the Cambrian. This apparent trend among apex predators for some evolving into feeding on small zooplankton is of interest for understanding the associated shifts in anatomy and behaviour, while the spatial and temporal distribution gives clues to an inherent relationship with ocean primary productivity, and how past and future perturbations to these may impact on the different tiers of the food web. The late Devonian Placoderm Titanichthys, a relative of the famous Doncleosteus, has tentatively been considered to be a megaplantivore, primarily due to its gigantic size and narrow, edentulous jaws, although no suspension feeding apparatus has ever been reported of until now. The potential for microphagy and other feeding behaviours in these fish was assessed via a comparative study of jaw mechanics in Titanichthys and other placoderms with presumed differing feeding habits. Finite element models of the lower jaws of Titanichthys revealed considerably less resistance to Vonomyces stress, with comparisons with a selection of large-bodied extant taxa of similar ecological diversity revealed similar disparities in jaw stress resistance. The results therefore conformed to the hypothesis that Titanichthys was a suspension feeder, with jaws ill-suited for biting and crushing, but well-suited for gaping ram feeding. The small, ineffective mouth plates that lacked a sharp cutting edge meant they would not have filled such a niche like Dunkleosteus, as their jaws were insufficiently mechanically robust. It was therefore assumed that Titanichthys was a suspension feeder, a feeding method that exerts less stress on the jaws, and allows them to better swallow or inhale schools of small fish and or zooplankton, therefore being the earliest known large-sized vertebrate filter feeder, preceding the Mesozoic Pachycormids by over 150 million years. The presence of these fish also supports the idea that productivity was high in the late Devonian, and also shows the wide diversity of Arthrodera, the order Titanichthys belongs to. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of Paleo Rewind, and hopefully you learned something new about the discoveries and or descriptions made for the month of May. To watch the next instalment, be sure to visit Stephen, host of Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, where he will be covering the month of June. And also to Edge, where a final compilation video of all of our parts will be uploaded to come the new year. I hope you all have had a fantastic holiday season, and are looking forward to the new year with some new ideas and goals all ready to go. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.